Throughout the world, people of faith are the first responders to the suffering of their neighbors, faithfully advocating alongside people who bear the ills of our times. It begins at the grassroots level, in the village, city, or the small town. A community rises to unite faith with deed, and the world changes. And we bear witness to a force of light that renews our hope. Water, air, soil, minerals, energy resources, plants, and animal life. The natural world is all around us. As humans, we rely on nature, and in turn, it is up to us to protect and conserve its resources. And we should care for it, not only because it is useful to us, but because nature supports the whole of creation. From the Congo, to Appalachia, from Mindanao, Philippines, to Nairobi, Kenya. Stewards of the Earth are challenging authority. This is a march against mountaintop removal. What they've done to the mountains, it makes me want to cry. And they were just hauling us through there like we were criminals. These stewards of the Earth are actively seeking solutions for a more ecologically equitable and sustainable world. These are the stories of Stewards of the Earth. The Republic of Kenya in East Africa is rich with geographic diversity. It has a long coastline along the Indian Ocean, but inland the landscape changes to savanna grasslands and bushes. Forests and mountains cover the west, while desert blankets the north. A vast majority of Kenyans, as with most parts of Africa, depend on the agricultural sectors to provide food, shelter, and education for their families. Tobacco growing was introduced into Kenya more than 35 years ago. Today, an estimated 20,000 small-scale farmers grow the plant over 37,000 acres of land. The Kenyan government, as with most other developing countries, depend on the large income tax generated by tobacco companies. In our country, we have the law which says no smoking. Kennedy Muita, a pastor in the United Methodist Church, lives in a village in southern Kenya, and many of his parishioners are farmers. Smoking is illegal, but at the same time, the same government supports the companies which are growing the tobacco. So it becomes difficult to officially ban the growing of tobacco. There's no law which governs the growing of tobacco. For example, there are no more trees. Rivers, uh, all our rivers are now dry. There's a problem, health problem to our, our, our people. The process of curing or drying tobacco leads to deforestation and soil erosion. Curing barns are designed in such a way that farmers are exposed to tobacco smoke, triggering tobacco-related diseases. In 1997, Muita studied agriculture and began to work for British American Tobacco, one of the world's largest tobacco companies, and the only place where he could practice agriculture. Then I was employed there for one and a half years. After working the economic, the economic part of it, I realized it was an exploitation to our people. According to the Social Needs Network, an environmental and socioeconomic development NGO in Kenya, earnings from tobacco are not commensurate with the effort and resources invested by farmers. Tobacco farmers are unable to feed, educate, or clothe their children adequately. For example, at that time we were buying tobacco from farmers at 50 shillings, Kenya shillings. And the same company would sell one kilogram at 480 shillings in Belgium. When you cost estimate all the loans and all the labor and everything, the farmer remains with only eight shillings from per kilo. The eight shillings cannot pay the school fee, cannot uh, buy food, cannot do anything to the farmer. 
Tobacco farming is highly labor-intensive. It can involve an entire family. In tobacco-growing areas, there is a high rate of child labor and school dropouts. Tobacco farming also leaves little room for the family to grow other food crops. The effect can be perpetual famine and malnutrition, especially amongst children. And then at that time I was appointed a pastor in charge of Moheto Church. Now the area where now the tobacco, the, the, heart, the heart of the tobacco center. And then I thought what to do to our people. Because if actually if I tell my people to stop growing tobacco, they would ask me definitely, what do we do? Where do we get the livelihood? Where do we get the um, sugar from and all those things? And then I had a second thought of what to do. I tried to consult with various farms. Then I consulted with the maize food company in Eloret. They deal with the chili, the chili growing, the so the, the so called um, chili sauce. And we had a workshop in my village. Then we called the farmers around. They came. We discussed with them. We discussed the piloting program on how we can start the growing of chili, but didn't pick up well. Only 20 farmers responded positively because uh, it was a new tech, a new invention, a new technology. They knew chili as a crop only meant for birds and poultry when they are sick. And they have never seen chili being sold anywhere. The 20 farmers grew the chili. After one year, the company came and bought the chili. The number kept on increasing. Now, this is the fourth year. We have about 400 farmers who have adopted the technology of growing chili. We found out the farmer will be getting about 68 shillings by the end of the day as a profit from the chili. The, the other 42 shillings will cater for other, the, the other services in the farm. I have six farmers who already, during the last season, they were able to sell over 100,000 Kenya shillings. And at least they've built good houses. They've bought some oxen for plowing. And I have uh, four students whose fee have just been paid all through by the chili which is not actually the case in tobacco because uh, with the tobacco you can't pay any, any school fee. I know the farmers have many challenges. They lack uh, incentives, they lack fertilizer, they lack inputs. We are trying to get uh, to, to lobby various organizations to be in partnership with who can come actually and invest in, in those areas so that at least uh, we can have uh, the people growing this, the chili. Well, I'm seeking partnership to help the farmer who can come and either loan or give the farmer some uh, motivation, some input. What tobacco has left us with is poverty. But we had cows, we no longer have cows. We have sold cows to buy food. We spend the time in the farm growing tobacco. We had uh, goats, we had timber, we had wood, but they are no longer there. So we are looking for partners who can come and at least help us wake up from where we are to a better standard who can maybe support the farmers with some uh, incentives like uh, fertilizer, tools. With the use of tobacco, tobacco companies give a lot of chemicals. And because of the poor use of chemicals, many pests have become persistent. Partners who can also partner with us actually to conduct workshops and seminars to, to teach farmers to change from, one, from this tobacco to other productive crops, which are not harmful to our environment. And if I've got this, uh, like the company we are partnered with, does not conduct workshops with the farmers. They just, they, they just came to help us just to buy the chili from the farmers. And we are not able to conduct workshops because actually they're expensive to move, moving up and, up and down, moving around, moving around. And that's why actually the number has not been so much. But if they would, if we would have another option on how we can reach many, I think it would be better. So that's why we are looking for partners. In a small village in Central Africa stands a giant of a man. His name is Bishop Natambo, and he is an imposing figure, a strong presence amongst admiring villagers. What was in my mind, what was my vision? To save lives. People were dying, and the church being a salvation. When the area was under colonial rule, the government moved the indigenous people here, it was swampland, so interwoven canals were dug to move water away from the village. Over time, the canal structures were buried under several feet of sand and vegetation. And when it rained, the village flooded and washed homes away. 
disease-carrying mosquitoes thrived in stagnant water, and people became deathly ill. Now, malaria was everywhere. Every week, they were burying like two or three children or adults dying from malaria and typhoid fever and tuberculosis. I heard about this, and I talked to the doctor here. I said, what can we do? What can the church do for to save lives? Finally, I decided with that young man, this man is a professor at uh, what is a uh, college here. I said, what can we do? Is there any way we can take out all the sand from both channel? So we made a decision to clean all the underground canal. We did it during the dry season. Nari ndirije ma travo a drenaje no yaku no kune kukoleja muno mose ne kufungwija mi vole yonso. Natumbo borrowed money from a United Methodist missionary, bought several shovels, and organized a community. At first, the villagers thought the bishop might be crazy, and the snakes unearthed from the dense muck of the canals were a sign of witchcraft. But when it rained, they saw for the first time water moving away from their village. The first rain, we saw the water from there starting to follow the canal up to the Camina Spring. So that was the beginning. Once the channels were cleaned and created to move stagnant water, malaria dropped by 70%. And the church being a salvation, not just feeding them spiritually, but responding to their material needs, health needs, intellectual needs, the church has done his job. And today, we are getting praise everywhere. Even the people from far away, from uh, America, from uh, South Africa, from uh, England, are coming to see what the church has done. If the church has no vision, population is perishing. Today is the day. Holy God, we give you thanks for these youth here. No one knows better than Reverend Paul Jaguna that the church cannot be silent to the issues that envelop one's community. The people and the community that we are dealing with is a community that is in great need, almost in every area of their life. There is a poverty level, there is a lack of education, there is health problems, and you know you cannot separate the, the religious issues with the normal way of life. You are not only dealing with issues that are spiritual, but also issues that are physical. We are so grateful that the Lord has given us a new day. He often turns to the United Methodist social principles to mobilize his parishioners. I know the social principles have helped me in so many areas because I help the congregation to understand that the church that we are in is a church that is concerned with every part of our lives. And each day, it's a new gift from God. Because By challenging the community from the pulpit, he empowers them, reminding them of a part of their lives they can control. A few years ago, every part of the road, wherever there is a face, there were all sorts of papers, Paradigm papers. And every time I would even sometimes challenge my people on, in, at the, in the pulpit on Sunday and ask them if they think the local government or people concerned are supposed to clean their area, I think we are even more responsible by just cleaning outside our doors and outside the gates where we come from. This is just to help them understand that the church is not only involved in uh, going to heaven, spiritual matters, 
but also issues that surround us. Chaguna also leads by example. At my own home, my wife complains that I have planted trees almost every part, and now we don't have a place to plant the, the, the food, the normal food that we eat. And of course I told her, we have stayed for three years without harvesting, and I thought we would even better get some good fresh air from the trees than burning from the sun. And so I, I, I do most of these things by example. You come to my home, it's like a small forest. Now when we come to Kenya, probably we can formulate some programs whereby even when the General Board of Church and Societies are not, are not able to travel, because I know oh, they may be having a lot of work to do across the world, uh, that there are programs that can, they can be followed. And maybe they can support in any way. It could be material. It could be resource people within our region or finances whenever they are available. Programs like uh, uh, tree planting, uh, clean water, emphasis that can be taken by the church uh, and probably be followed for a particular period and see the outcome or the results. The Philippines is primarily an agricultural country. Nearly 40% of the labor force live in rural areas and support themselves through agriculture. This is Luya, ginger. It is unique in that it is the only predominantly Christian country in Asia. That's why uh, part of our development as pastors, we have to do this. And part of our subject is geotheology. We appreciate the, the yeah, God's grace through these lands and through these plants. And this is a uh, alugbati, kamoting, kamoting kahoy, and this is what? beans. Beans. Seminaries place a high priority on studying environmental justice and practicing the farming of useful plants for consumption and medicinal purposes. These are the young ones that we have just planted. It's known as geotheology. Geotheology is about uh, our responsibility to creation, our responsibility to make the land become productive for uh, uh, people so that uh, the produce of the land may sustain life of the community. It's a part of uh, the calling as a steward, steward of God's creation. And it is because uh, the environment, the, life, the land is the source of life. So we have to uplift anything that uh, has anything to do with the uh, sanctity of life. The capacity of creation to sustain life must, must always be there. And uh, this capacity to sustain life must not be destroyed by human beings. Our Philippines are rich in nature, in land. Everything you plant in Philippines, it grow up, it bear fruits. It is one way to alleviate poverty. We need to plant so that we have uh, food in our uh, families. It's a kind of a ginger that uh, we usually cook it with uh, this lemon grass as an alternative for coffee. Okay. Yeah. Plants, land is part of uh, the creations. Yes. This is the expression of God's love especially in us as Filipinos. Yes. Lands are very important. Uh, papaya. papaya. Seven out of ten farmers do not own the land they deal, so they are landless farmers. It's estimated that about 40 million people live below the poverty level in the Philippines. <laughs> and farmers make up a majority of that number. And they are at the mercy of the big landowners, especially in uh, exacting from them uh, uh, the land rent, usury, uh, high prices of uh, agricultural inputs like fertilizers, pesticides. They only receive a, a, a daily allowance or salary of uh, less than 100 pesos, and that is only around more or less two dollars a day. 
they cannot afford to, to send their uh, children to school, they, cannot, uh, they do not have any medical and uh, uh, hospitalization, they can't afford it. It's organic. They are really oppressed, they are exploited, and they live in extreme poverty and hunger. This is one of the reasons Pasqua and community organizers take geotheology a step further toward activism. The land also is their base for their political power. And, and so uh, if, if they own the land that they till, they can also uh, meaningfully participate in in the exercise of political power in the community. In this way, uh, we believe that uh, the vital step to the reduction of poverty is the distribution of land to, to, to the farmers who do not own the land. People are, are not healthy because uh, they're not eating enough. Uh, and they're not eating enough because their produce actually is uh, taken away from them. Uh, even if they are the rightful owners of the produce, because of the unequal rights between the landlords and the tenants, it is always the landlord who takes uh, the bigger share and leaves a, a very small share to the tenant who produce the food. Uh, gardens both uh, by group and by individual. Yeah. The economics of sustainable agriculture isn't the only issue that requires organizing. The context in the Philippines is uh, more on opposing big corporations that exploits our natural resources. The country's natural elements, as well as its geographic location, can be devastating to its population. And our work with the, uh, the people in disaster situation is based on the uh, uh, situation that the Philippines is a disaster-prone country. It is located in the typhoon belt. An average of 25 typhoons hit the country every year, and at least six of them are disastrous. Earthquakes occur almost every day. You know? There are around 200 volcanoes in the Philippines, and 20 of them are active. And the most recent one is uh, uh, Mayon Volcano, uh, Taal Volcano, and the Mount Pinatubo, which has uh, um, claimed many lives and, dis uh, and destroyed many uh, properties. The National Council of Churches Disaster Response Program responds to communities that are hit by both natural and human-created disasters. By uh, Human-made disasters, we mean uh, disasters brought about by development aggression, like, for example, operations of mining, uh, mining companies that uh, were in, uh, there are mining accidents that displaces many people. Uh, there are also communities displaced by armed conflict, by the, uh, uh, between the, the ongoing armed conflict between the government and the armed groups in the Philippines. So, uh, we have these internally displaced people. We have programs on education and training, which we provide to our church people and ecumenical partners, as well as vulnerable communities to better prepare them for disasters. No? We uh, assist them in uh, organizing their disaster response committees, or their disaster response programs, especially for the, the churches. And uh, we develop the community-based disaster plan. The Philippines is among the top 10 nations in the world experiencing climate crisis. As long as they are the people who have the least capacity to recover from the devastation, they are our target um, uh, beneficiaries of our programs. In addition to the relief and emergency response work, the National Council of Churches advocates for policy reforms. The goal is to empower people economically so that they can better prepare for disasters. 
we need to couple our relief work with advocacy work. No? Advocacy work of continuing preservation of our environment. No? Because um, uh, as you well know, uh, climate change is now a major concern in the, in the world. And I think uh, uh, it has really affected the Philippines. For the previous years, most of the, the, of, of the typhoons were coupled with mudslides, landslides, and uh, uh, this can be attributed to the worsening weather conditions, the continuing degradation of our environment, which has really added to the, to the, to the vulnerability of the people. In 2008, the Fraser Institute ranked the Philippines to be one of the five most mineral-rich countries in the world, estimating the nation's wealth to be at $1 trillion. Throughout the years, the government of the Philippines' ambition to become a world leader in mineral production has had a negative impact on both its population and its land. The mining industry has caused massive displacement of indigenous peoples and the militarization of their ancestral domain. The Ecumenical Council for Corporate Responsibility issued a report in 2009. It stated that mining causes large-scale ruin of the island's environments and livelihoods, and it particularly undermines food production and sustainability. For instance, in the mountain province, uh, Lipanto Mines, which is a uh, U.S. corporation, dumps their mine tailings into the river, poisoning the, the whole river system. Some Australian corporations are also doing some surface mining, and, and they're destroying the river systems, the ecological systems. In some cases, the conflict has become deadly. Dome An is a young widow who has lived underground ever since her husband Pepe, the son of a farmer, was murdered. He grew up in a community where he saw families enjoy the full harvest from their farms. His dream was to see an empowered community. For example, farmers' community where the farmers get to enjoy the fullness of their harvest the farmers get to send their children to school, meet their needs, you know. So for Pepe, his uh, passion was to um, help make that kind of community come to reality. Dome An and Pepe became activists during the course of community-based development work. He embraced this mission of trying to bring forth a community where he could once more uh, enjoy that kind of abundance and peace. At the same time, be able to contribute to a society where his own children would also enjoy that kind of environment. It was a very personal um, sense of uh, what is good, what brings happiness to him, and a very personal sense of what is just also. The young couple became involved in protesting the Philippine Mining Act of 1995. It allows for foreign mining companies to operate in the country. We study this law. We network with those who also study this. Of course, we found it threatening. We found it counter to what we consider sacred, the sacredness of land, of life, of community, especially the indigenous peoples where I belong with. We conduct education, we conduct reflection sessions within the community, we coordinate activities for the communities and for the people to discuss about this law and to evaluate its impact to the community. They became known for organizing protests and speaking out against the Unjust Mining Act. Yeah, we lobby to various government uh, institutions, to various uh, church uh, institutions, and to individuals. We organize rallies, we organize um, 
people to mobilize or to to come together and express their their sentiments in various venues be it creative be it uh, formal uh, hearings or be it legislative be it uh, lobby work the couple helped draft a document to articulate the sentiments of their communities and they facilitated channels to use this document to impact the US Congress the day I was supposed to arrive from Hong Kong, where I was supposed to meet Pepe, uh, he, was, uh, he was on his way to Manila to talk with a fellow church worker who happens to be with the United Methodist Church also. Um, they were going to arrange this, uh, this meeting with uh, representatives from the United Methodist Church coming from the United States. Unfortunately, he was killed before he met this fellow church worker. A man on a motorcycle, wearing dark clothes and a helmet, shot and stabbed Pepe as he was walking. Sadly, this is not uncommon in the Philippines. It's suspected that his murder was an extrajudicial killing, the killing of a person by governmental authorities without the sanction of any judicial proceeding or legal process. It's an issue that many religious organizations are addressing. It's been three years since Doman's husband, Pepe, was murdered. Today, she continues to heal from the trauma, living underground, protecting her safety. What I resolved to do is to try to understand war, the pains, the struggles that people go through as I go through it as well. I've been trying to understand the art of war in order to understand the art of peace. Mining activities are linked to serious problems throughout many countries in the world. The history of mining in the United States begins underground in its heartland. It has always been a dirty and dangerous job. It's estimated in the history of United States coal mining, more than 100,000 miners have lost their lives in accidents. Yet, many miners will attest to the advantages that coal mining presented them. I'm a miner through and through. Uh, that's how I made my livelihood. Uh, that's how we bought our house. Before Tommy retired, as a coal miner, he was able to raise his family, buy a house, and live in the mountains of eastern Kentucky. The companies that I worked for were very responsible. There wasn't any of the silt that made it to the creeks. There is no other place that I had rather live than right here. Uh, I've always said that you could take the mountain, you could take the boy out of the mountain, but you can't take the mountain out of the boy. There's just something about these hills. Uh, when you look and see uh, of a springtime like we are now, the beauty uh, of God's handiwork as the, as the trees are leafing out and budding out and, and then, uh, in the fall, the leaves turn and the beauty of, of the handiwork of God's hands, uh, the different colors that are here, there is just no other place to me than right here in the mountains of Eastern Kentucky. Sadly, it is also in this heartland where some of the most violent ecological destruction can be found. I was born here and uh, my father was a a union coal miner. Derby is a, just a great place to grow up as a child. We moved to Chicago when I was 10 years old, and uh, I came back when I was in my 40s. What they've done to the mountains is, is just devastates me. It makes me want to cry.
It's known as mountaintop removal and valley fill, a coal mining practice where tops of mountains are removed, exposing the seams of coal. Mountaintop removal can involve removing 500 feet or more of the summit. The earth from the mountaintop is then dumped in the neighboring valleys. The result is the deadness of a moonscape. It is disastrous to the environment and to the surrounding communities. Our selfishness of sitting back and not being our brother's keeper as we should have been many, many years ago. Many local communities throughout the area have joined forces to speak out against the hot button issue, including parishioners from the United Methodist Church in the town of Derby, Virginia. We had a meeting down at uh, Mountain Empire Community College about the strip mining. The Vision Mine of Minerals set up that meeting. And if you wanted to speak, they would, they would take you in a, a room and you, you spoke your piece about strip mining. The Vision of Mine and Minerals treated us like we were criminals, didn't they, Raymond? And uh, here we was there trying to voice our opinion, and they were just uh, hauling us through there like we were criminals. Now, that's political right there. And that's what, that's what our politicians are doing. And... Uh, we don't have any say so. Many of us joined the Sam's Club and the Sierra Club when we found out that what was happening. The sad part is that one of our good friends over in Rhoda, where this began many years ago, he started fighting the battle himself. Eventually he had to just move out. Because of the dust, the air pollution, the water pollution. There are currently no state or federal agencies tracking the overall extent of mountaintop removal, but it is estimated that 980,000 acres have been forever changed in West Virginia, Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. It amounts to this is their job. The more strip mines they have, the more assured they are of having a job. And some of them would even tell you, well, I've got so many more years I'm going to put in, and then uh, it doesn't matter to me, you know, I'm going to be retiring. But I want this strip mining to go on until I can retire. It's, it's that job security for them. The Environmental Protection Agency states that the impact of mountaintop removal on nearby communities is devastating. Dynamite blasts needed to splinter the rock strata are so strong they crack the foundations and walls of houses. Mining dries up an average of 100 wells a year and contaminates water in others. And the purity and availability of drinking water are compromised in many coal field communities. And in some cases, the mining practice has had deadly consequences. Three or four years ago, a little child was killed two or three o'clock in the morning, a large boulder. The dozer pushed the rock over the hill and it went through the house and killed this uh, I think the boy was two or three years old. It was 2004 when a half-ton boulder was accidentally and illegally dislodged by a mining company. And Jeremy Kyle Davidson, a three-year-old Virginia boy, was crushed to death in his crib. The boulder crashed through the side of his house and two interior walls. It was this incident that brought the issue to the forefront and became a rallying point for many of Appalachia's residents. For the first time, they began to speak out. Stop mountaintop removal! Last year, this group traveled to Washington along with hundreds of other people and presented their case before the Department of Interior. Over 25% of our county has been surface mined, pretty much gone. We're hoping that this will make an Im impact. At least it has temporarily, it has stopped some of the mountaintop removal. But the citizens remain concerned, and rightly so. We're concerned about our schools. They want consolidation. They want the school in Appalachia to close down. Where Appalachia school is, the whole community there is nothing but coal in and under there that they can't get right now. They want that. If they close the school, I guarantee you they'll wipe Appalachia out.
the government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, another country immensely rich in natural resources, banned mining in the east of the country in 2010, attempting to crack down on illegal mining and government corruption. The mine, we essentially found copper mineral and zinc mineral. But there are also some metals inside in small quantities like germanium, gold, silver, cadmium, etc. It is Jekamin who produce the mineral from the mine. But the mineral, after treatment, after concentration, after metallurgical plant treatment, it is sent to Europe, to Europe for selling. The United States is also a, a, is purchasing mineral from DRC also. Here in the DRC, there are miners who work long shifts seven days a week. Typically, there are three shifts per day with eight hours a shift. The conditions vary from mine to mine. I know that uh, there are some private mines which are working in good conditions, like uh, uh, Somika, like uh, Shemaf, but there are also other mines, small mines, private mines, uh, artistical mining, which are working in more or less bad conditions. About uh, five years ago, in uh, around Likasi, at uh, Shinkolobwe mine, there were a lot of children, a lot of people working in uranium mine. But at the moment, our government took a measure, took a measure to remove them out of the mine. The government has also passed laws to address some environmental issues. Because uh, our new mineral code uh, uh, says there are rules there for envir environment. Because every mine, every mining uh, causes damage to the nature, you see, uh, woods, water, etc. They have a duty to restore the environment. We speak different languages, live in different lands, and bring our unique heritage and history to our community struggles. As caretakers of creation, we share a resource known as Earth. It is incumbent upon us to support an ecological, equitable, and sustainable world, leading to a higher quality of life for all of God's creation.